we owe people working in the field more than what we've been giving them, mm-hmm. right? There's a high rate of burnout. Um, and, and if you ask a business owner, what is the single most important asset you have? What would you say? I would say it's the culture of the people. And the, peop- the people, right? I mean, yeah. and then if you look at a business owner's budget, that tells a different story. I mean, if, if you put your money where your mouth is, then you'll actually invest meaningfully into each and every person so that they can develop and grow. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, that's what we did in positive recovery. But now we need to develop our core values for our organization. Mm-hmm. And most organizations, when they are developing their core values, they can spend weeks, months. They can hire people to help them to develop their mm-hmm. core values. We locked ourselves in a room for one day. And what we came out with was amazing. Mm-hmm. To this day, some of the core values that we developed back then have carried over into positive recovery centers. And I just think that's awesome. And it was done by a committee of all different employees, which was really exciting. It was just the leadership. Everybody was engaged in it. And we followed a lot of the ones that Zappos was using. And one of them I really like is having fun, creating weirdness and having right, fun on the right, job because right. that's so important as well. Right. I, I remember going to tour Zappos yes. with you and, you know, they, they tour the headquarters and it's not like a million pallets of shoes and you're not looking at the technology. It's a bunch of cubicles. It's a call center. Right. It's, it's unbelievable. But they have so much fun there. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, they said, you know, don't take our culture. You, it just won't work. And we didn't, we actually, we did, we created our own people that have come through and went to other places have asked to take our core values with, yes. mm-hmm. you know, that, that was, um, that was awesome. And it's, it's been quite a ride, you know, um, the impact that it had not only on our clients, once we started kind of putting positive recovery out there was huge and really big piece that I remember is one of our maintenance guys. Do you remember that story? It's, I, Yes. Yes. Yeah. The shed, the shed meetings. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so, um, for those of you that are listening, it might not make sense to you, but the impact that it had just changed his life. And so I remember him coming to me and also sharing with Dr. Powers that, you know, this, this, I didn't know what I was going to do with this, but this has changed my life. It has made my life so much better. And in that moment, I remember Dr. Powers saying, this is what it's all about is changing people's lives. Mm. Right. So the story was, it was Robert Wingate. I don't think he'd mind if yeah, using her name. He's a great guy. guy. So, he was, you know, he's a maintenance guy. And we, the rehab was like a bunch of old houses put together. It looked like a wildebeest, right? We had an old Euro tan, a couple of houses. And um, so there was a lot of work to be done. And there was so much, um, I guess, r- repeat business. And, you know, people in departments weren't happy because something would break and they didn't fix, break again. And so Robert Wingate started having these meetings inspired by the positive recovery training where he started the meetings with gratitude instead of, you know, here's the list, here's a bitch session of like, here's what we've got to do. And here's who is unhappy. And he started that. And he said, after a few weeks, not only did he, could he feel the morale getting better, but there were so many less repeat jobs. So effectiveness, you know, people were just more effective in their job. They felt happier. And yeah, yeah that, that, that's list. great. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Their punch list turned into yeah, a gratitude list. list. Yeah. Oh, interesting. When you think about your schooling and the education that you got from University of Pennsylvania, what did the positive psychology set you up to do for positive recovery? Totally. Yeah. So first of all, I just got to thank George and the company for investing in me to go um, to the University of Pennsylvania. It was an Ivy League. It was a master's. It it was just, it was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. And what we got to do there is study under the feet of masters. One of them, Martin Seligman, who founded positive psychology. He's, he's probably one of the top three most quoted psychologists of all time. He's just an amazing guy, great bridge player as well. Just never sleeps like me, but he's always up like playing bridge. It's not what I'm doing. I'm playing Clash Royale. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, you know, like I was saying, the application of positive psychology to addiction was very natural. And, here, and here's, here's why. So Martin Seligman's theory of happiness is under the acronym of PERMA, which stands for Positivity, Engagement, Relationship, Meaning, and Achievement, or P-E-R-M-A. Positivity. You can think of it as your online experience of feeling good. Like, are you happy? It's not limited to just that feeling because positivity also includes awe, tranquility, any positive emotion. Um, E, engagement, is that state of flow or being in the groove if you're a musician. It's when you just lose sense of time and space. It's the best activity humans can do. Relationships is R, and it's positive relationships. M is meaning, meaning and purpose. Uh, How much of that do you have in your life? And A is achievement. And think of these as buckets. Now, you don't 
have to have them all full, right? Um, somebody like me who's an introvert that uh, is, feels a little awkward around a bunch of positive psychologists because they're just too damn happy <laughs> on the outside singing Kumbaya. You know, I, I may not have, my bucket of P may not be so big, but my M is big, my A is big, my R is big, it can't be bigger. Um, so as long as there's, you know, as long as there's something in those, or Marble Josh, to use um, Renee Brown's, uh, you know, metaphor of, you know, how much you've got invested in. So PERMA, positivity, engagement, relationship, meaning, and achievement, this is where you find human happiness once your needs are met. So obviously, if you're in a war-torn area or if you're starving, you're not really doing anything but trying to survive. But most of us aren't really living under those conditions. So free human beings across cultures, across time and space, pursue PERMA. And the research shows that people who have those are happy. We study happiest people, what do they do? You know, and they weren't, their life is a good experience, is, is an experiment. Um, the natural application of positive psychology to addiction was reinforced during my studies up at, the, you know, UPenn, because almost without fail, each of our professors used AA or Alcoholics Anonymous as a microcosm, sort of an example of what they were talking about. Think about meaning and purpose. That's where spirituality exists. Carl Jung, who was, uh, you know, next to Freud, a great Vienna psychiatrist, was one of the inspirations for the 12 steps, you know, and he's the one who coined the term spiritum contra spiritus, which means, you know, addiction is like a spiritual malady. And it, in his experience, only those who had spiritual transformations got better. Well, of course, I'm in an academic center. We're not talking about, you know, lofty things. We're talking about research. And the thing about meaning and purpose is that spirituality is in that bucket, but it's under the guise of um, pursuing something sacred. So even atheists and agnostic people have sacred places, sacred people, and these add to your life. And, and every time, uh, so it's a funny story. The very first day of positive psychology, Martin Seligman calls people out, like three or four students. You don't know ahead of time he's going to do this. And he has this baritone voice. So, you know, I was, I think the first one called out and, oh my God, I was going to pee in my pants because there was the first day I was in a group. I don't know. There's like 70 people. I don't feel like I belong. I feel like I'm the dumbest person. I'm looking at these great people who I can't even like fathom. And, um, he said, so we'll see if, um, he belongs and if we'll let him stay. And then he had me say my piece. And I was thinking, you mean there's a chance I'm not going to stay? I'm like, damn, I already got admitted, you know, like. The only way I'm leaving is feet first, dude. Mm -hmm. But I did say, you know, I was in recovery and then I saw the application of this to, to recovery. And so when each of our teachers would use this as a microcosm, like the whole class would look at me and kind of give me a thumbs up. Right. And, and it's just been great. Anecdotally, people that have gone through the training and have gone elsewhere have wanted to use this curriculum. It is being used at other places. And patients that, that have gone through this have, you know, and I, I, I feel a little uncomfortable when I get praise, but you know, even still today, there's people that, that contact me and thank me and they, they say it was transformative. And the thing is, you know, it's nothing in here is a secret, mm. right? It's all evidence-based. You can find, find this in libraries online and, and we don't try to sell a bunch of goods that aren't going, that we're not going to be able to deliver on, mm. right? We deliver mm. flourishing. We give people the tools. One of, one of the things that I've, that I, that sort of drove me to do this was that I was going to work every day and I was having like an existential crisis on a daily basis. I, I, I would get up and go to work. We were like working really hard, but outcomes were terrible, right? Like relapse rates are high during and soon after treatment. So not only did we owe people that worked for us more, like in terms of giving them good training, but I felt like we just, we owed patients more. We owed the, the field. We, we have to do something. And so part of I guess me coming to peace with what I do for a living and wanting to improve outcomes was, you know, these things help people thrive. And I think addiction develops because people are just going about happiness the wrong way.